This video is a tutorial on using STIM, which is a tool for simulating quantum stabilizer circuits. Quantum stabilizer circuits are a particularly simple type of quantum circuit, simple enough that you can actually simulate them efficiently without a quantum computer. But despite that simplicity, they are complex enough and rich enough to represent very important protocols like quantum teleportation and quantum error correction. So in this video, I'm, I'm going to be going through an example of simulating a quantum error correcting circuit or almost a quantum error correcting circuit. We're going to be doing a repetition code. So first we have to get STIM. And there are a couple different ways of doing that. We could clone the GitHub project, get to get the C++ code and, and build that and make the command line tool. But that's sort of complicated. And instead we're just going to use the Python bindings. So STIM has a Python package called STIM, which we can install using pip, just like any other Python package. The first time you run this command, it might take a few minutes to finish because it will actually build the code behind the scenes on your machine to make it as fast as possible. But anyways, once that finishes, we can start up a Python interpreter and we can import stim in that interpreter and see what is available to be used. So for example, there is a circuit class and we can make an instance of that circuit class uh, and we can do so using um, a bit of a domain specific language that STEM supports, where you just have a series of lines and on each line you have you start with a gate and then you give a series of numbers corresponding to the qubits that you want to operate on. So this first line is saying, I want to apply a Hadamard operation to the qubit whose index is zero. Um, and then I want to apply a controlled not operation from qubit zero to qubit one, where zero is the control and one is the target. And then I want to measure both of them. Okay, so that's my circuit. Once I have that circuit, I can get samples from it. Um, I can compile a sampler and then I can sample, sample a shot. So here we can see that both of the measurement results return to zero. So this is the first one, that's this one, and this is the second one, that's that one. And we can run this a few times. Um, this particular circuit should randomly output zeros or ones. We got quite the run of zeros there, that's, that's kind of surprising. Uh, we can also make, take a bunch of samples all at the same time. So the, at this point, you essentially have all the tools that you need in order to, to go and simulate a circuit. And we're going to start focusing a little bit more on which circuit we're simulating. Uh, in particular, we're going to be doing a repetition code. So what is the structure of a repetition code circuit? Well, in a repetition code, you have a series of data qubits, which are you're repeating your data over in a series of measurement qubits, which you're using to check whether or not each data qubit is different or not from its neighbor. And as these different or not different measurements change over time, you can use that to figure out where errors are occurring. So in order to perform that difference measurement, we need to apply operations that are actually in our gate set. In this case, we're going to be using controlled not operations. Uh, for each measurement qubit, we're going to apply a controlled knot from its two data neighbors onto it, which will put the parity of those two data qubits onto that measurement qubit. And then we're going to measure the measurement qubit and reset it. So now if I insert an error into the system, we'll get notifications effectively that something is wrong. Like the measurements will return unexpected values and the locations of those excitations in the measurements will tell us where the error is. Uh, and then we just repeat that indefinitely. So that's what we're gonna make. And let's, let's go about making it. So we're gonna make a method to create a repetition code. And the repetition code is going to have some number of data qubits, which we're going to call the distance of the code and it's going to repeat for some number of rounds. So we're going to create an empty circuit 
and then we're going to start putting these operations into it. So we want to do these control node operations and we want to do these measurements and we want to do these resets. So for, uh, well actually first what we should do is we should actually define some values to represent all the qubits we're going to be working with. So for a distance D code, we're going to need uh, D plus one data qubits and D measurement qubits. So in total, we need twice the distance plus one qubits. And since in STEM, the, each qubit is just you know an integer referring to its position, we can use Python's range function to just get a, a list of that size of the, the numbers counting up to that. The data qubits are going to be every other qubit in this list starting from zero. So in Python, there's a, a nice notation for taking every second thing from a list, and that's what we're using here to get our data qubits. And then our measure qubits, we get similarly, but starting from one instead of starting from zero. Now, referring back to the circuit that we're trying to make, uh, I'm actually going to put this on the side so that we can see it simultaneously. The first thing that we want to do is we want to apply these controlled not operations. So for each measurement qubit, we want to apply control not, a controlled not operation from the data qubit before it to that measurement qubit. So we're going to call circuit dot append operation, and we want a C not operation. And it goes from the qubit before to the measurement qubit. And then we're going to do the same thing in the other direction. Just like that. And then the last thing we do is we measure and reset the measurement qubits. So stim has an operation for measure and reset called MR. And we're going to apply that to every one of the measurement qubits. So let's, let's see what our circuit looks like so far. So if we make our repetition code with a distance of, of three and two rounds. Oh, so as you can see, I forgot to put anything in for the rounds. So Stim actually supports multiplying the circuits, so I can just multiply by the number of rounds. So, uh, there is a little bit of a complication here in how this is being displayed. So you might notice that we added the controlled not operations one by one. But here, uh, first of all, controlled not has been abbreviated as CX because a control an, a not gate is a Pauli X gate. Uh, also, all of the targets of the operation have all been shoved together onto one line. This this is just a like a a fusion step that stim does automatically which makes it a little bit more efficient and it's just kind of telling us that it's doing this uh, the way you read this list is you just look at adjacent pairs so this is saying we're going to do a controlled knot from qubit 0 to qubit 1 and also from qubit 2 to qubit 3 and then from qubit 4 to qubit 5 and then 2 to 1 4 to 3 6 to 5 and actually knowing that this is going to happen we can make our code a little bit simpler. Because you'll notice um, these, this is just counting up to five. So the first control not operations we're applying, the targets are just the numbers up to one less than our, our qubits. Um, so we just take the list of qubits, excluding the last one. And that's our, our first set of targets for the control not operation. So going to replace it like this. And then for the second one, uh, here it's a, maybe a, a little bit harder to spot the pattern, but it's still not too bad. Uh, you notice it goes 2, 1, 4, 3, 6, 5. And these are paired together like this. Uh, if we go sort of in the slightly opposite order, we see it goes 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So this is just counting from the top to the bottom, skipping 0. So we take our list of qubits, we skip zero, and we count backwards. 
uh, you certainly don't have to do this kind of optimization to your code as, as you're writing the circuits, but it, it's nice to keep things simple as you go, or at least that's what I like to do. So now we have a set, effectively the same circuit coming out at the end uh, with the minor difference that this is in a slightly different order than it was before. But we have our circuit. And we can simulate our circuit uh, by compiling it into a sampler and then sampling from it. Now, I, I don't particularly like the way that this is being displayed. I don't think this is going to be very helpful for us. So I'm going to write a quick method in order to produce a, a nicer looking sample. So instead of printing out the NumPy array, we're just going to take the sample and turn it into a series of zeros and ones. So I'm going to get my sample as I've already shown. You compile a sampler sample it once and we're going to get that sample like that first sample and then we're just going to put together a quick string representing each of the things from it so now if i make my repetition code and i take a shot from it i get a string uh, and actually, I'm not even going to return the string. I'm just going to directly print it out so that I don't get little quotes around it. Great. So uh, certainly what we're getting out right now is not very interesting. And the reason that it's not very interesting is there's no noise in this circuit. Like a repetition code or, or an error correcting code, they tend not to do anything interesting at all unless you put noise into the system. So let's put some noise into this system. Uh, let's make it so that before every round starts, we apply a random bit flip sometimes to each of the data qubits. So we're going to use a noise operation instead called X error. We're going to apply that to the data qubits and we're going to apply it with a probability. And that probability is going to be, um, actually let's make this a parameter called noise. So this noise parameter is the probability that these errors are being, insert, being inserted. So rep code. Oops. So we're going to take a shot from rep code distance three rounds two and noise set to 1%. And now as we run it a few times, we can see that every now and then we get ones indicating that errors occurred. Let's increase the number of rounds and the distance so that we get more things to work with. Um, let's actually set the distance to the width of the terminal so that it wraps just right so that time is vertical and space is horizontal. Um, I know that I can get the width of the terminal. Uh, I did this in the past, so I can just auto-complete it. There it is. Okay, the number of columns should be the width of the terminal. And we're going to take distance to be that. And we're going to set the rounds to a bigger number and run it. Yeah. Uh, although I, I still don't like the way that the zeros and the ones are a little bit hard to tell apart. So I'm actually going to change the method that we're using to print them out to replace the zeros with underscores which will make things a little bit more visually clear. Yeah. Okay. So now what, what we're looking at is each column here is one of the measurement qubits from our circuit. And the spaces and the ones are telling us the measurement result. And you can kind of tell when a data error occurs, you get a pair of ones next to that location. So there's like a data qubit between these two columns and there is an X error on that data qubit right here. And so now there's, it's different from its two neighbors and it stays different over time. And so you get these streaks where an error introduces these differences and they stick around 
until other until other errors occur that like move them. So here a data error occurred between these two, between these two, and turned this one back off, which kind of made it look like it moved. Now, uh, this, this particular type of noise where you insert data errors at the start of each round is a, is a very simple type of noise. In reality, as you're running the circuit, every single operation that you apply isn't perfect and you'll be accumulating error as you apply them. Uh, additionally, we might not just have uh, X errors, like bit flips, we might have phase flips. So instead of uh, this kind of classical noise model, let's use a more quantum noise model where we are depolarizing the qubits. This, this just means that we, when the noise applies, it randomly picks an X, a Y, or a Z to apply. And instead of only applying it to the data qubits, let's apply it to all the qubits. Um, and let's do that as part of the measurement. Uh, okay, let's, let's just move this stuff around. So as part of the measurement and the reset, we're going to be depolarizing each one of the qubits at the noise level. And like I said, every operation we apply is going to have some amount of control error. And in order to represent that control error, we're going to insert op errors onto the qubits being targeted by the operations. And we're not just going to do, uh, sorry, I need a one here in order to indicate that this is single qubit depolarizing error. We're going to be inserting two qubit depolarizing error onto the targets of these operations because these are two qubit operations. Okay, I, I can tell that I'm, I'm going a little bit off the rails in terms of my explanation here, so I'm going to switch over to Quirk and explain what, what these noise models are. So when you have a two qubit operation, like a, like a controlled knot, Physically, you're going to perform some series of pulses or, or whatever in order to implement it. And those pulses aren't going to be perfect. And that will introduce error. And what makes a quantum error correcting code useful is that it tends to digitize these errors, which means it's okay generally for us to model them as, instead of like small rotations, as just a small probability of a simple error occurring. So typically, errors will be digitized into Pauli errors, which are bit flips, phase flips, or bit and phase flips, where this X gate is a bit flip, Z is a phase flip, and Y gate is the combination of the two. Because we're interacting the two qubits, the elements that the, this noise model is built out of are combinations of Pauli errors. So it's possible that you get X on one but it's you know, equally likely under this model that you get X on one and Y on the other, or X and one on Z on the other, or Z on both. And two qubit depolarizing noise, the operation here is effectively saying with the probability that you gave me, I will pick a random poly for both of the qubits. I'll make sure they're not both identity and I'll apply those. That's, that's what this is doing. And this is just a, a pretty good, simple approximation of the control error inherent in applying a gate to a quantum, a noisy quantum system. Okay, so now we have our, our circuit and we've added circuit level noise to it. So a, a non-trivial noise model. We can look at our circuit we have our controlled knots, we have the depolarizing noise associated with them, then the next controlled knots, their depolarizing noise, and then noise associating with the measurement and reset. And we can take shots from this. And if I scroll up quickly, you'll notice when we only had X errors between the rounds, it was always the case that these ones showed up in pairs and stuck around. But with this more complicated noise model, sometimes we see other things. Sometimes we see a one all by itself. This is actually an error occurring on the measurement qubit. 
flipping the measurement. So it, it's just like a wrong measurement. Uh, the, instead of this one indicating that there's a problem with the data, this one is just wrong. It, really, this should be a zero, but because the system's not perfect, this is going to happen. Now, there's still a problem looking at this data, and the, the problem is that it's, it's kind of visually very dense. Like when it, like one error gets introduced here at this point in time, and it leaves traces all the way to the end of time, or like where we're sort of taking errors and we're making them look very big. The error happened here. We shouldn't be drawing stuff related to it here. Uh, and the trick that we're going to use in order to, to fix this problem is we're, instead of looking at one measurement, we're going to look at adjacent pairs of measurements and basically say, are they the same or are they different? And STEM includes functionality for doing this. And specifically, the functionality that it includes is this concept of a detector. So a detector is a set of measurements that you would like to compare. So I can insert a detector into my circuit. And specifically, um, the detector is something that doesn't target qubits. It targets the measurement record. So instead of passing in a qubit, we're going to pass in a target into the measurement record. And we're going to pass in minus 1. And minus 1 means the previous measurement. So it's the same as when in Python you're slicing into a list. Minus 1 means the last element. Here, minus 1 means the last measurement result, or the latest measurement result. And we'd like to compare that measurement result to the one that happened on the same qubit in the previous round. And we know the number of measurement qubits that there are, uh, which is the, the distance of the code. So we just take the one that we're, we take the measurement, we compare it to the one from the previous round. Um, there is a problem here though, which is during the first round, this is going to try to look at the measurement from a round that didn't exist. Uh, so if I try to take a shot, well, actually taking a shot will work because um, it's not sampling the detectors. In order to sample the detectors, we need to specifically ask for it. So uh, instead of a shot, we're going to take a detector shot. And instead of compiling a sampler, we're going to compile a detector sampler. Uh, now, if I run, if I run that method, it's going to give me an error saying that I'm looking before the start of time. Um, and I'm going to fix that in sort of a hacky way by just having some dummy measurements at the start of time. In order to do that, I'm going to have to uh, have a start of the circuit that's separate from the, the round part of the circuit. So I'm going to rename circuit to like uh, circuit round. Or actually, I'm going to keep that, keep that the same and say full circuit equals circuit times rounds. Return the full circuit. And actually, full circuit is just going to start as an empty circuit, and we're going to append that into it. And then before we append that into it, we're going to put the, the dummy measurements that we want in order to make this, to, to get around this kind of problem of looking at things that don't exist. Um, this is a little bit annoying, honestly, to have to fix, but it's, it's worth it to not have it silently fail when you get it wrong. Uh, I have had that happen in an earlier version, and it was quite confusing. Uh, anyways, we're going to put in these dummy measurements at the start of time, the measurement qubits, and that should fix this issue. So we'll just quickly look at the circuit. We see that our dummy measurements are there, and then we have the rounds, and we have our detector. We only have the one detector. We're going to need one for each of these measurements, but let's just check that this is working so far. Good. That looks right to me. Now, instead of one, we're going to have many. So for, for each of the measurement qubits that are present, or for each of the measurements that are present, we want to put this detector in. 
and instead of just looking at the previous one, we're going to look at the previous k compared to the previous k before that, or something like that. And now we're looking a little better. So uh, if we take, if we sample the measurements, we see this, and if we sample the detection events, we see this. This is the same data, basically, represented in a slightly different way, which is that uh, this row is equal to the parity of two adjacent rows. So it's this row zored with this row. And as a result, instead of getting these streaks, we just get spackle. So this would have been a streak, but it becomes just this local thing. Um, additionally, these individual ones get amplified a little bit into a pair of ones. So this first one is saying, oh, it went from zero to one, and that's different. And the second one is saying, oh, it went back from one to zero, and that's, that's different. But then it stays the same. Um, and actually, there's a really important property that we've just introduced into the system by doing this, which is now every single error in the system, at least in the central area, comes in pairs. So uh, if, you, if you check, you can see each of these ones has a partner. The exception to this is near the sides. It is possible for there to be a, a one on its own. In this case, I don't see one of them. Let's run it again and see if we can spot one showing up. Uh, ah, here we go. Here's one on the side all by itself with all the other ones paired. And I think this one is also by itself. Um, and actually the error correction problem, like the problem of figuring out where the errors occurred and how to fix them, basically comes down to pairing up these ones. It, it's figuring out, does this one, do these two ones go together or do these two ones go together? And generally you just go by whichever is closer. Uh, but if the noise level gets too big, if we increase the noise rate from 0.1 to point, <laughs> from 1% to 10%, then you can kind of tell that the problem is essentially becoming unsolvable. There's just too many ones in order to, to tell how they pair up. But with low noise level, it becomes very easy. Um, and sort of the tricky cases are the intermediate ones where it's probably still possible to solve this problem here, like the pairing up problem, pretty well. But you're going to need uh, a good algorithm to do it. Uh, anyways, there is, there is still one problem left with our circuit. Uh, and that problem is that we're not actually measuring the data at the end. So once you've preserved the data for all these rounds, you, you should be measuring it, right? So the last thing that the circuit should do is it, it should measure all the data. And when we measure the data, we also get more detectors. Uh, we can check if the parity, the last parity measurement of two data qubits agrees with those two data qubits. So if, if the measurement qubit between two data qubits says, these are supposed to be different, and then you measure the two data qubits and they're the same, something is a little bit off. There's, there's been an error nearby. Uh, and that's basically what we want to, to tell STEM by giving it more detectors to work with. So again, for each of the measurement qubits, we're going to be doing these comparisons. Um, in this case, there's one more measurement than there was before because there's one more data qubit than measurement qubit. And what we're comparing is a data qubit measurement to the data qubit measurement that's just next to it to the measurement qubit measurement from before, which is going to be uh, the distance away from, from here. Uh, I will say keeping these indices straight is, is of course difficult. It's very easy to get this, this wrong. Like I, I might have, this might not be minus two, maybe this is minus one or minus three. I'm pretty sure it's minus two. Um, 
generally you're you're not going to be making this is kind of why you won't be making circuits that you have to stim by hand you'll be writing code to do it i mean ideally you wouldn't even be building the circuit so directly like this you instead define the circuit in some slightly more abstract way and then some would have code that would take that representation and spit out a circuit for it um I'm just taking a few shots here to to see if the number of ones along the bottom bottom row makes sense to me or not. And it looks about right. If I got that minus two wrong, it would probably look a little different. Maybe. Okay, I I guess I just said that there was one thing left to do for the circuit, but there there actually is one thing left now. And that is we have to define what is the result of the circuit. So there, there's supposed to be some logical value that the circuit is protecting. And we would like to see that logical value at the end. And in stim, the way that you define a logical observable is use instruction observable include. This is extremely similar to a detector, except you can build up an observable as the circuit runs. So in addition to specifying uh, a measurement record to include in it, you also have to say which observable you're talking about, and we're just going to say we're talking about the observable with index zero. And then when we sample the detectors, we have to explicitly say, you know, tell us the logical observable result also. Uh, I should be seeing Hold on, I've made a mistake somewhere. Oh, I appended into the wrong thing. Okay, that looks right. And then that looks right to me. Okay, so now in addition to our kind of field of detection events, we have this one extra value at the end, which is the final logical observable measurement. And the error correction problem basically comes down to predicting based on the these up here, based on this part whether or not this part has been flipped or not um, and concretely what this comes down to is looking along this left edge and seeing if there are ones that are by themselves for each of those ones that are by themselves the logical observable was flipped um, this is a consequence of me basically saying that the logical observable is defined by the data qubit that's to the on the left hand side here. Um, so, all right, great. Uh, here's an example of the logical observable is supposed to be off. We prepared a zero qubit implicitly in the circuit, and instead the measurement is on. But we can see that's actually explained in the detection event data by this one being here by itself. Um, and with the error rate this low, with the ones this spread out, it, we're basically always going to get a correct diagnosis of what's going to happen based on pairing up logic. Uh, if I increase the noise level, it, it, it basically becomes impossible to tell what this value is going to be based on the previous values. Okay, um, that, that basically is all that you have to do in order to use stim in order to, to do an error correcting code, at least in this, this bulk sampling kind of mode. So uh, I made this method that will print things out when I get samples, but instead of printing them out, I could you know, get thousands of samples. Uh, actually, let's, let's do this. Let's, let's take a lot of samples from a big circuit. Okay, so we want to make a big circuit. So let's say a repetition code with a distance of 100 and 100,000 rounds with a noise level of 1%. We'd like to sample from its detection events so we compile a detector sampler and then we sample it. And let's say we want 256 samples. Um, actually, because this is so many samples, instead of getting the bits each as an individual uh, byte in the NumPy array that's coming out of this method, I'm going to ask it to 
hack eight bits into each byte so that it, it's not too big. And let's actually see how long this takes. Uh, you have typed this wrong. Compile detector sampler. Compile detector sampler. Oh, I, I, I just forgot an R. Sampler, not sample. Okay, so this is running now. It shouldn't take too long to finish. Yeah, okay, so it took about 10 seconds. Uh, honestly, I'm not particularly happy with that level of performance, but it did just produce uh, 100,000 times 100 is 10 million times 256 is like 2 billion. It did just produce 2 billion bits of data and put them into this, this array. Um, let's reduce the rounds by a factor of 10 and do it without bit packing so that we can more easily work with the data. This should finish pretty quickly. Yeah. Uh, and that, now we could, with this data, we could compute simple things like um, we could look at what is the detection fraction. So we could sum up how many ones were there in the detection data. Oops, I need NumPy. Uh, and we could divide that by the number of uh, possible detection events, which would be the product of the shape. And I need math. So we can see that in, in this particular circuit, when we ran it and we took the detection events, we are getting a detection fraction of around five to 6%. All right, now let's do something almost completely different. So what, I, what I've been showing you so far is a mode of working with STEM where you create a circuit and then sample from it. And you don't really have any ability to change things in the middle of the circuit or, or make decisions or, or look at what is the state of the simulator. But STEM also has uh, an interactive simulator, which is the Tableau simulator. And this allows us to work more gradually. So instead of having to make a circuit ahead of time and pass it in, we can say, I would like to do a Hadamard operation to the to qubit zero, and then it does it. And uh, it has an internal state, which we can look at. I'm not gonna go into the details of how the simulator works. There's a, a paper that I'll link from the description of the video that you can read if you'd like to know that. Um, the point is that you have access to this internal representation. And actually, you don't just have access to it, you can do like algebra on it. So let's, um, let, let's apply a few more operations just to get it into a non-trivial state. And then we'll get the internal state. You can print it out in a slightly nicer style. Um, again, not going to go into what exactly this is representing or, or how it's representing the state of the circuit. The point is that uh, once you have it, you can like do algebra on it. You can compute the inverse, you can raise it to, to powers, you can multiply them together, all kinds of fun things like that. Uh, additionally, because the simulator because the simulator supports this interactive usage, you can create situations that require dynamic feedback. So a, a typical example of a quantum protocol that requires feedback is teleportation. And in a teleportation circuit, like Alice and Bob are trying to move a qubit from one place to another, and Alice will do some measurements, and based on the results, Bob will, will apply some corrections. Let's, let's, let's do a teleportation circuit. Um, let's make a method to do it. So teleport demo. We're going to make a simulator. Um, and let, let me lay out the circuit that we're gonna make. So in a teleportation circuit, at the start of time, Entanglement is created between Alice and Bob. So uh, these top two qubits are going to be Alice and down here is going to be Bob. So let's um, say Alice is one, Bob is 10. 
and we are going to apply Hadamer to Alice's qubit, and then a controlled not operation from Alice's qubit to Bob's qubit. And we, at this point, there will be entanglement established between those two qubits. Then Alice is going to pick a qubit that she wants to send. So let's um, let's set, send a qubit in the I state. So we're going to um, pick a message qubit, prepare it into some state. It doesn't matter what state we pick. All states should work. And then in order to transmit or to move the qubit from Alice to Bob, Alice is going to perform a bell basis measurement. So she's going to apply a control knot and that followed by Hadamard and then measure like that. So control knot from the message to the entangled qubit, then a Hadamard the message qubit, and then she's going to measure both of those qubits. And those those two measurements are going to tell us whether or not the the transmission was perturbed in particular ways on its way to Bob. And uh, just let me remember how this is supposed to work. So this measurement is telling us whether or not they are different in a Z basis. So if they're wrong, they're, I think that goes backwards. Anyways, based on these measurement results, you're supposed to flip or not flip Bob's qubit. I'm hoping that I got them, that I got the correction right here. It's very possible that I flipped the X and the Z. I do that all the time. Uh, so now, at this point, it should be the case that Bob's qubit is in the same state as Alice's qubit. And we can check that by, by measuring it. So we could unprepare the state, like we just do the opposite of the operations here. So we apply the inverse of S. And we apply Hadamard, which is its own inverse, and then we measure it. And it should be false if we've done everything correctly. All right, let's run it a few times. And it looks like it's working. So we did a simulation, we did some intermediate measurements where we reacted to them and got some final measurements to check ourselves. Um, for this particular case, it's actually not necessary for us to, to do this conditional stuff in Python. Stim is capable of performing conditional operations based on previous measurement results, as long as they are Pauli operations. And in this case, they are Pauli operations. Um, so we could make a teleport circuit where uh, basically I'm just going to be copying from this side of the screen. So we apply Hadamard here, CNOT from 1 to 10, make our message qubit, then perform the bell basis measurement. And then we perform these conditional operations with the measurement record. So if the, if the first measurement we did, which is the second latest measurement, came out true, then we have to apply an X gate to Bob's qubit. So if that's true, X gate, Bob's qubit, same thing for Z. Then uncompute Bob's qubit, assuming that we did it correctly, measure it. And then basically, if everything is going well, what the output of this circuit should look like is two random bits followed by a bit that's always zero. So let's try sampling from it. Compile a sampler.
And looking at the data, it looks like we have two random bits. These two are random, and the last one's always zero. So this, this indicates that it's it's simulating the teleportation protocol correctly, at least in this case. Okay, that's that's essentially everything that I wanted to cover. There are additional things in STEM, but I, I feel like at this point we've covered most of the meat. If people have particular cases that they would like to see covered or they'd like help with, leave a comment below the video and I'll respond to it and consider making another video based on that. Thank you for your time.